On 5 News, Trump is welcome in Britain. Theresa May says she's very happy for the president's state visit to go ahead, despite growing anger over his travel ban. Also, terror in Canada. Six Muslims are shot dead during evening prayers in a mosque. The Tunisia beach attack, the inquest into the deaths of a British couple, hears his ambulance was delayed by up to 20 minutes. And she's the woman of the moment, so why is the star of La La Land lashing out? I, I would hope that people would fight for what's right and what's just human. Hello and welcome to 5 News. I'm Sean Williams. The government says Donald Trump is welcome to make a state visit to Britain, despite nearly one and a half million people now having signed a petition against it in the wake of his immigration crackdown. Right now, the Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson is defending the visit in the face of anger from a number of MPs in Parliament who've called the travel ban divisive and wrong. Meanwhile, the president himself has backed his policy, tweeting, there are a lot of bad dudes out there. Here's Simon Weigar. Do you believe it? No. Is this liberty? No. The wave of anger is growing. These are protests against the travel ban in the United States. This is the most un-American thing I think that's probably happened during my lifetime. And that wave of anger is spreading around the world. This afternoon, an online British petition calling for President Trump's state visit to be downgraded neared one and a half million signatures. Time to uninvite Mr Trump, Mrs May. No comments from the Prime Minister, who delivered the invitation to the President last week. Labour is united in opposition. The President has signed an order preventing people from certain countries from visiting, identified them from a particular face. It is outrageous. It is illegal as well as being immoral. And I think we should stand up for the values we believe in as they don't discriminate. If there is a state visit while the ban is in place, the impression will be given that we condone or endorse this uh, ban. And we've got to be quite clear, this sort of ban is wrong, it is cruel and it is shameful and it sends all the wrong messages around the world. What about Mr Johnson? I'll, I'll, be, I'll be speaking later. The Foreign Secretary was called to Parliament to clarify the ban. Uh, we have an exemption for UK passport holders, yeah. whether dual nationals yeah. or otherwise. And I think, and I think most fair-minded people uh, would say that that actually showed the advantages of working closely uh, with the Trump administration. Hand in hand with the Prime Minister last week, today the President tweeted his clarification, saying he's not anti-Muslim, but anti-terrorism. He said, if the ban were announced with a one-week notice, the bad would rush into our country during that week. A lot of bad dudes out there. A state visit is when the red carpet is literally rolled out, here for the Obamas six years ago. And invitations are not withdrawn, even if big protests become a certainty. Simon Viger, 5 News. Well, there's still a lot of confusion about who exactly Donald Trump's travel ban affects. It keeps changing all the time. The executive order that he signed on Friday involves these seven countries. In theory, it bans anyone born there from entering the United States for 90 days. But here's where it gets a bit muddy. There was concern about dual nationals, those who have a passport from one of those countries, as well as, for example, one from the UK. So Mo Farah is one of those, born in Somalia, but has UK citizenship. He was worried he wouldn't be allowed to return to the US, and that's where he lives with his family. Yesterday, the Foreign Office appeared to get some clarity, saying the only Britons who'd be affected are dual nationals who are travelling from one of those seven countries to the US, and they would get some extra checks. But this afternoon, the US Embassy in London issued official guidance which contradicts that, saying all dual nationals are banned no matter where they're travelling from. Let's try to get some clarity. Go to Downing Street. Simon Vigar is there. What's the government been saying about this travel ban, Simon, and who exactly it affects? 
Well, the Foreign Secretary, Sean, has just been speaking in the Commons and he's contradicted what the Embassy said. He said it's exactly the same as yesterday. It doesn't matter where you were born, doesn't matter if you have a second passport, you can travel to the US as you could before. So it is still confusing, I'm afraid, but that's what Boris Johnson is saying. What we don't know is that if you start your journey in one of those uh, seven countries, whether you're going to go for extra checks there. But Boris Johnson is adamant it's exactly the same as it was before the weekend. OK, now there are protests planned across the UK in some major cities tonight about this travel ban including one around the Downing Street area are they likely to make any difference well, that petition is uh, nearing one and a half million now, Sean, but uh, this invitation for the state visit is not going to be rescinded. The uh, re petition for a second EU referendum got over four million signatures and there's no sign of that uh, happening. The protesters are going to make a lot of noise tonight. They say that the message is uh, clear, refugees are welcome and President Trump is not. He is saying he's simply implementing what President Obama wanted to implement. And uh, Trump can be accused of a lot of things, but on this, he is consistent. He's doing exactly what he said he was going to do. Simon, thanks for that. Well, Donald Trump and his aides deny that the executive order is based on race or religion, but to many, that's not how it feels. Peter Lane has been to Bradford, where there's a mixture of anger and deep concern among people of all religions. At Bradford Central Mosque this lunchtime, prayer and reflection, and no shortage of strong views about President Trump's travel ban. The countries that he's chosen are Muslim-majority countries, so for him to claim that it's not a ban on Muslims, um, I don't think is true. Would you feel happy, safe to go to America? No, 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 definitely not. You wouldn't go? You wouldn't try no, to go? No, 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 no. no. Every uh, bureaucracy, every government have right to... Uh, to defend, to, uh, to defend. He can do what he wants. You respect him. Yes. You respect well, his I position. Respect. Yes, it's all right. As a British Muslim, are you worried about I'm your worried travel? I'm worried for everybody's. Not Muslim, Christian, Hindu, Jews. Everybody. Everybody's. Equally concerned about a wider ripple effect, representatives from Britain's Jewish community visiting the mosque today to enhance cohesion. America has just sent a message that is taken as a gesture of evil intent towards Muslims or people just because of the country they live in. It's going to have a drastic impact on communal relations and we all need to come together to, to deal with this as a community and even though he's the most powerful man on the planet, we need to tell him that it's wrong. Do you believe Donald Trump when he says this isn't about religion, in fact it's about security? I just don't believe Donald Trump full stop, so I'm, I'm not sure where he is at the moment, who's advising him, uh, and uh, I, I think uh, we need to take this very, very seriously. Questions and concerns at one mosque in one corner of the country. President Trump's decision-making process already prompting reaction here long before the man himself arrives in the UK. Peter Lane, Five News. To the day's other news now and the Prime Minister of Canada has condemned what he says was a terrorist attack on a mosque in the city of Quebec which killed six people. The victims were gunned down by masked men who stormed in during evening prayers. Two suspects are now being questioned by police. Dominic Reynolds reports. A stretchers carried past and behind the camera the sound of men praying. <laughs> In this mobile phone footage, you can't see the Quebec mosque that was attacked, but you can see some of the consequences. Six people were shot dead last night while they prayed. Canada's leader didn't hesitate to call it terrorism. Justin Trudeau said, we condemn this terrorist attack on Muslims in a centre of worship and refuge. Diversity is our strength and religious tolerance is a value that we as Canadians hold dear. This afternoon, officers revealed that one of the two men they've arrested called the police himself after the shooting and waited for them. But they said so far a motive isn't clear. This is a picture of the inside of the Quebec Islamic Centre two years ago. It's thought last night 50 people were in the room when the shots were fired. Eight are in hospital. The mosque had been a target of hate before. A pig's head was left at the doors last June with a message, Bon Appetit. 
Quebec City today has been hit by terrorism. From the premier of Quebec last night, a message of solidarity. I want to say a few words to our fellow Quebecers, Muslim Quebecers. We are with you. This is your home. You're welcome here. We are all Quebecers. In his year in charge, Justin Trudeau has pushed a new vision of Canada. No national identity at all, just shared values of people who arrived from all over the world. This attack doesn't match that vision. Police say extra security is being sent tonight to protect mosques across Quebec. Dominic Reynolds, 5 News. Coming up on 5 News. A nurse gives evidence of ambulance delays at the inquest into the deaths of British holidaymakers killed in Tunisia. And why the stars are hitting out at Donald Trump. Making sure that they're working. It's really sad that a the voice of divisiveness you know, can prevail over the one of unity. So I hope, I'm glad that there's people on the streets with courage to, to be out there expressing that, expressing love. We'll see you after the break. Hello and welcome back. You're watching 5 News. Inquests into the Tunisian terror attacks in 2015 have been told how an injured British tourist died in the back of an ambulance after it waited for up to 20 minutes to leave the scene. 66-year-old James McGuire was shot alongside his wife Anne while on their first holiday since retirement. She died immediately. Their story was told as the inquest continued to hear evidence about each of those who died. Leila Hayes was at the Royal Courts of Justice. Anne and James Maguire were on holiday when the attack happened. They had got a last-minute deal to Tunisia. Both were shot near the hotel's swimming pool as they tried to flee gunman Seferdin Rizgui. Anne died at the scene. James died on the way to hospital. Today, the court heard from Carol Harrison, who was on holiday with her husband Brian at the time. She told the court that as a nurse, she'd tried to help James Maguire as he lay injured, but that he later died in an ambulance. She said it was more like a patient transport vehicle than an emergency one. There was no visible equipment other than oxygen. It waited outside the hotel for 15 to 20 minutes. I asked several times, can we go? This man is having trouble breathing and needs to get to hospital. James and Anne were among 30 British tourists killed in the attack in Sousse. Today their son described his pain. In a statement, he said, they were both taken from us in a senseless attack, like so many others. It's heartbreaking that they have missed out on meeting their granddaughter, Lily, and will never see her grow. This computer-generated image, shown to the court today, shows the movements of the gunman as he entered the grounds of the Mahaba Hotel. He'd already killed many people on the beach, but continued his rampage here. Images of his victims superimposed where they were shot, including David Thompson, and Anne and James Maguire. Inside court, statements were read out from a number of survivors, including Andrew Bramley, who was on holiday with his partner. He described seeing the gunman shooting people on the steps to the hotel. But he said he wasn't spraying bullets, he was taking aim. And he seemed calm, like he didn't have a care in the world. These inquests will hear evidence about each of the British victims who died, and will look at whether anything could have been done to save them. Leila Hayes, 5 News. The leaders of Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland have been meeting Theresa May to argue they should have a louder voice in the Brexit negotiations. In Cardiff, the Welsh Assembly leader, Carwin Jones, told us he believes his differences with the Prime Minister can be resolved, but Scotland's Brexit minister says while he's prepared to compromise, she isn't. Our chief correspondent, Tessa Chapman, reports. You don't have to look far in Wales to see evidence of EU investment. In Ebba Vale, after years of decline, there's a shiny new college, transport links paid for with European funds. So perhaps inevitably some locals are worried about life post-Brexit. It's a major part of our, our sort of financial structure here and I think sort of I don't think we'll ever build up this industry in this area again. So uh, we're going to lose a lot by being out of Europe. We could lose a lot of funding, well, probably not just for you, but for all over the country, um, you know, by going out. Uh, I hope things work out. But it's a complex picture. 
62% of people here voted to leave in the referendum. They want their government to have a say in what kind of Brexit that means. Down the road in Cardiff, Theresa May was leading a meeting with government representatives from the Welsh, Scottish and Northern Irish devolved governments to discuss just that. Two hours later they emerged. So how did it go? So far, so good. But this is not about being listened to or being managed. This is about being a full uh, part of the process. That means being involved in the uh, discussions, having observer status at the negotiations to make sure that all four nations are properly represented around the table in those negotiations. Both the Welsh and Scottish governments have made clear they want full access to the single market. But time is ticking until Article 50 must be triggered. I don't see yet the willingness of the UK government to recognise that there isn't one state. There are four countries engaged in this. Are you willing to compromise? I, the Scottish government has compromised very, very significantly in the paper it put forward. I don't think anybody could doubt our bona fides. We've worked incredibly hard on this and we're prepared to go on working hard on it. But there has to be that step change from the UK government. It is outside the meeting rooms that post-Brexit Britain will take shape. Many Leave voters here feel EU money has been badly spent anyway. They voted for change. They're waiting for the politicians to wrangle and see what that means. Well, let's cross to a rather rainy Cardiff now and talk to Tessa there. Um, Tessa, we heard there what the Welsh Assembly and the Scottish Government are saying about these talks. What's the government saying about the success of them today? Well, no word from Theresa May. She had to dash off to Ireland for another meeting, but we did get to talk to some of her Brexit ministers afterwards. They said they were pleased with how it went. They are confident that they can reach a Brexit deal that is good for all four devolved administrations. That said, Theresa May said earlier today that after the Supreme Court ruling last week, the relationship with the EU is ultimately a matter for the UK Parliament and the UK government. So there are wild differences here on the single market issue in particular. But today we haven't had a whole lot of concrete movement uh, towards a common position. All right, Tessa, thank you. Now, it's not unheard of for award ceremonies to get a little bit political. And it's fair to say that last night's Screen Actors Guild Awards in Hollywood was dominated by one thing. Star after star used their acceptance speech to condemn Donald Trump's travel ban, including the La La Land actress Emma Stone, who called it inexcusable and scary. Minnie Stevenson has the story. Now, it wasn't a case of who they were wearing, but what they were wearing last night. A protest against Trump's controversial travel ban. The tone was set from the start. Good evening, fellow SAG-AFTRA members and everyone at home and everyone in airports that belong in my America. Hollywood Screen Actors Guild Awards provides a platform for the world's most high profile. And last night, they used it. While La La Land may have provided light relief for the world, its star and winner of Best Actress Emma Stone wanted to talk Trump. We have to speak up against injustice and we have to kick some ass. I would hope that people would fight for what's right and what's just <laughs> human. Winner of Best Actor Denzel Washington's speech even sounded presidential. I think we as Americans better learn to unite. I think we as Americans need to put our elected officials' feet to the fire. This is what's happening. And God only knows where it's going. And Fences was a good movie, too. As Dev Patel, nominated for Best Supporting Actor, said Trump's immigration policy was devastating. Utterly heartbreaking. I mean, to, to, the, the first image that went through my head was this, you know, these women and children turning up to these shores with hope in their hearts, you know, and dreams in their minds. and just being turned away, it's, it's horrible. With the Oscars fast approaching at the end of the month, expect many more high profile people to get political. The thing with the Oscars is, if you win, you obviously get three minutes on one of the world's biggest stages. And you, what you see is, you know, actors, writers, directors want to use their time on that stage for something good. So I think we can expect to see them using their two or three minutes to speak about Trump. And for an actor, there can be no bigger stage than the Oscars in four weeks' time. As we know, that's a long time in politics. Minnie Stevenson, 5 News.
Now, before we go, Matt's joined us to tell us what's coming up on Five News tonight. Hello, Matt. Hi, uh, Sean. Something we could never be accused of, but we're going to be talking about fake news later on. I'll be speaking to kids TV presenter Dave Benson Phillips. There he is. He says fake news reports that he died in a car crash had a major impact on his life. I'll also be meeting an urban explorer who's walked two and a half million steps in cities across the UK with that thing on his head measuring brain activity to work out how the landscape can affect our mood and health. Check out our Facebook page to find out how he felt about your hometown or city. Search for Channel 5 News and tune in at 6.30 to find out why. <laughs> Look forward to that. Thank you very much, Matt. That is it. For now, though, Claire Nazir has the weather for you next. I'll see you again tomorrow at 5. Matt, of course, back at 6.30. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.